dynamics and its consequences. Here's an email I received from a PhD in economics soon after the release of Zeitgeist Addendum. Dear filmmakers, my son presented me the first, the first half of your film last weekend asking me my opinion of the opening section about the fractional reserve lending practices. I'm a PhD certified economist of 12 years and teach macroeconomics. While I always was cognizant of the creation of money and the sale of government bonds, I had never stepped back far enough to see the larger issue your film presented. I find it tremendously disturbing that the creation of value through debt is indeed, by all formal logic, an imposed condition of deficiency, an instigator of public servitude. I'm not sure what shocked me more. The fact that this is true, or the fact that after the many years of education I've had on the subject of economics, this reality never even occurred to me. While it seems counterintuitive to think that a person who should, by all social standards, be an expert in a given field due to their awards and credentials, very often, especially in the purely intellectual arena, su such exposure to set established curriculum uh, can really hinder someone's openness in a, in a very powerful way. For you become cognitively blocked from new ideas and realizations, which, you know, if they're outside of the existing framework that you understand, then you have no chance of even realizing it. It's restricting your perception. Jacques Fresco, who dropped out of school at the age of 14, has a great example regarding this perceptual point. During the time that the Wright brothers were building a machine that could fly, expert physicists and engineers were busy writing books about how it was impossible for man to ever fly in any meaningful way. Apparently, the Wright brothers, who were bicycle mechanics, didn't read those books. <laughs> in other words, creativity will always serve you better than just book smarts. So, with that in mind, let's step back and pose a very simple question about the economic structure we all live in. What are the lowest common denominators required to perpetuate a market economy? One, human labor must be sold as a commodity in the open market. Outside of investment and inheritance, nearly all money is obtained through income, and income is derived from wages or profit in some form of employment. Therefore, there must always exist a demand for jobs where the economy cannot operate. Two, money must be continuously transferred from one party to another in order to sustain so-called economic growth. This is done through constant or cyclical consumption by virtually everyone in society. Jobs are entirely contingent upon demand for production in some form. If there is no demand for, for goods and services, then there, there, then there will be no demand for labor and hence financial circulation would stop. Needless to say, these two aspects of the system, which of course are intimately connected, are absolutely paramount to the functionality of the system, to the financial system. If either one of them were substantially hindered, the integrity of the economy would be seriously compromised or possibly be made entirely obsolete. So given this reality, let's now hypothetically consider some variables which could put these mechanisms in jeopardy. In the first point, labor sold as a commodity in exchange for money, what if human labor market became unnecessary to the production of goods and services? More specifically, what if automation technology and artificial intelligence became advanced enough to allow for the replacement of perhaps 40%, 50%, 60% of the human labor force? At what point would such displacement, thus unemployment, be considered too much for the system's integrity and put it into question? As far as the second point, the need for cyclical consumption, what if conditions arose where the circulation of money was severely stifled? In other words, what if people simply did not need to continually buy things? What if, hypothetically, it was discovered that through optimized techniques in resource management, design, and production, the most commonly purchased goods could either be made obsolete by larger order renovations, or could have such extreme product efficiency, longevity, and near maintenance-free durability, that most items could last a lifetime without replacement or major repair. Of course, this exact idea couldn't be applied to perishable items such as food, but following the same train of thought, what if the cultivation and production of food was in such ease and abundance, through, through technology obviously, that the supply and demand equa equation made the value of such items utterly negligible? To put these points in a different way, let's consider the classic economic concept of theory of value. Everything in society theoretically is given a value based on two considerations. The scarcity or availability of the materials used and the amount of human labor required to produce a good or service. 
So if material scarcity, both in terms of resource availability and quality, was not the issue, and labor, human labor was not required to create or a good or administer a service, then there would technically be no value. Well, as most of you in this room uh, probably already understand, one of the greatest realizations of Jacques Fresco and the Venus Project, which should be one of the greatest realizations for the whole of humanity at this point in time, is that neither of the scenarios presented are hypothetical. Human beings are indeed being replaced, becoming obsolete, in other words, in the, in the labor force due to advancements in production technology. Likewise, powerful new design advancements in production efficiency and resource management reveal profound possibility of relative global abundance and peak product efficiency. This can be proven through statistical analysis and the inferential extrapolation of historical trends. Obviously, the corporations aren't out there telling you this. You have to dig much deeper to find this information. When it comes to production automation capabilities today specifically, the first thing to consider is a statistical evaluation of a phenomenon called technological unemployment. Technological unemployment, which is the unemployment caused by the use of machines as vehicles of labor, has continually and systematically forced relevant numbers of people out of every single new emerging sector for the past 300 years. Our current employment market is basically broken into three sectors. Agriculture, including mining and fishing, manufacturing, tangible goods, and service, intangible goods. As a near universal social progression, all societies tend to follow the same developmental path, which takes them from a reliance on agriculture and extraction towards the development of manufacturing, such as automobiles, textiles, shipbuilding, steel, and finally towards a more service-based system. Naturally, the only reason some countries are farther behind in this process than others has to do with the affordability of the technology required to make it move to the next level. It's irrespective of social system or political disposition. It is a scientific progression. So let's consider this phenomenon using the United States as a proxy. Coming from the States, that's a lot where, a lot of where my data comes from, but please note that this is, can be applied to any, any economy. In 1860, 60% of Americans worked in the agricultural sector. However, today, due to advancements in machinery and automation, less than 1%. Fortunately, those technological advancements also gave rise to an emerging industrial revolution, and by 1950, 33% were employed in the factory-based manufacturing sector. As of now, due to continual advancements in machine automation, it is less than 8%. So considering that only roughly 9% Granted, there's probably a few percent leeway on there, depending on which analysts you use. So there's only 9% of Americans working in agriculture and manufacturing now. Where did everybody else go? The service sector. The only thing that has saved the U.S. labor market after the technological renovation of the agricultural and manufacturing sectors is flight to the service industry. From 1950 to 2002, U.S. employment in the service sector went from 59% to 82%. The service sector is the dominant employer of Americans today, along with all other industrialized countries. Of course, this begs the question, is this sector insusceptible to the wrath of technological unemployment? Of course not. With the advent of increasing versatile computer technologies, we are seeing job displacement once again, this time in all service industries. The replacement of tellers and cashiers with kiosks, the use of automated voice systems for phone service, the internet has completely redefined retail, not to mention full kiosk systems in physical marketplaces, advanced food prep machines, and even research done by automation these days. As economist Stephen Roach has warned, the service sector has lost its role as America's unbridled engine of job creation. As a unique example, in Germany, the first completely automated restaurant is in operation. It uses kiosks for ordering and payment. The food is served by a fully mechanized system. There is zero wait staff. There is no reason that this idea could not be done with every single eating establishment in the world. In fact, if one was to think creatively about the application of technology in general, in, in isolation you see pockets of things where you see a news report about a certain technology that can do certain things. If you were to apply those creatively, I don't see how 90% of the entire service industry couldn't be wiped out tomorrow. 
The only reason it hasn't been done is because the focus of society is backwards when it comes to social progress. To illustrate this point more so, let's stop thinking about technology in terms of unemployment for a moment and consider it from the angle of productivity. The most incredible relationship of all of this is that the more technological employment